Welcome to day eight of the Pearson Centre's Change Conference, today to talk about Canadian culture. My name is Francesca Iacorto and I'm a board member of the Pearson Centre. I'm also the Senior Director of Public Affairs of the National Airlines Council of Canada. As you may know, the, the Pearson Centre is a progressive think tank that addresses the big economic and social challenges of the day. This conference builds on the last year's work when we addressed COVID and beyond through 40 seminars attended by over 8,000 people. Over the last three weeks, our conference has consisted of 12 webinars, and we are proud to say that we are the only think tank conference which has included representatives from all five major federal parties, the top business and labor executives, and many other experts. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together to come up with good public policy ideas. The focus of the conference is simple and seeks to answer the following question. With everything around us changing so fast, how do we plan for the long term? But before we get into that, I just want to take a moment to recognize that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. I also would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors who supported this panel and the conference. They include Bruce Power as platinum sponsor and CN and the Hill Times as gold sponsors. And of course, a very special thank you to our sustaining sponsors that include Canada's Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, and MFCO, Ontario's professional employees. While these webinars are free to attend, we invite you to visit uh, our website at thepearsoncenter.ca and make a contribution if you are able. Today, our webinar is on Canadian culture, broadcasting, diversity, and the web giants. A conversation with the Member of Parliament for Laurier Saint Marie, the Honourable Stephen Guilbeault, who is also, of course, the Minister of Canadian Heritage. He will be in conversation with Indira Nedu Harris, who is the Associate Vice President for Diversity and Human Rights at the University of Guelph, and formerly a broadcaster, MPP, and Cabinet Minister in Ontario, as well as in a conversation with Andrew Cardozo, who, of course, is the President of the Pearson Centre. In terms of the format, um, our guests will have a discussion for about 45 minutes before we turn to you, the audience, for your question. So please use the question box on your screen and we will get to as many questions as we can before wrapping up at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time. And on that note, I will turn things over to Andrew. Thank you, Francesca. Uh, welcome, Minister. Uh, we have a number of Thank questions and, and issues we'd like, like to uh, talk to you about. I'm going to ask Indira to start and then I'll, I'll catch up in a few minutes. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Francesca, for that lovely introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important conversation about Canadian culture, broadcasting, diversity, and the web giants. Today, we will take a look at the role Canadian culture plays in building an inclusive Canada where everyone has a strong sense of belonging. We will look specifically at broadcasting and the web giants and how these sectors are responding to Canada's growing diversity and the role they play in influencing our culture. Now, as we all know, this conversation is more important now than ever before. That's because COVID-19 has put us all to the test. This past year has been a difficult one for all of us. And the reality is that the pandemic has challenged each and every one of us. And it has also shone a bright light on the troubling inequities in our country. These gaps are threatening to pull us apart as a nation. The recent Black Lives Matter movement has raised troubling questions about racism and inclusion in our communities. For example, we know that women, indigenous peoples, black folks, people of color, people with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ2IA plus community, and newcomers have all been hit particularly hard during these tough times. So what are we doing about that? How are we strengthening our culture and our country to ensure that all Canadians are well supported as we look at the tough challenges of the future? Job losses, economic challenges, mental health issues, and growing health care concerns are just some of the problems we will have to find ways to solve in the years ahead. And as we look to the future and how we rebuild, 
during these challenging times, we have to look at how we build stronger and better. We have to look at how we build a future for all Canadians, no matter their backgrounds, traditions, or experiences, so they can all call Canada home and be successful. After all, when all Canadians succeed, Canada succeeds. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. And here with us to answer some of those questions is Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Guibault. Welcome, Minister Guibault. Thank you very much, Indira. Minister Guibault, this is your first term in politics and in cabinet, and it's been a difficult year for Canadians. So, you know, many challenges, people are needing all kinds of supports. So tell me about what your year has been and what has you what have you learned essentially and and you know what challenges did you face and how uh, how did you solve them? Well, I, I should start by saying that I feel very privileged. Um, you know, I haven't had to, to 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 worry about my job, about being able to pay the rent at the end of the month, um, and 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 everyone in the family is safe. Um, it's been challenging a little bit for the kids uh, with the lockdowns and and all, but overall everyone is doing fine. So, in comparison to many Canadians, my 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 challenges are essentially professional challenges um, and, and certainly not personal. Um, it has, I mean, as a new member of parliament, um, um, I, I was on house duty this morning. Um, I heard a, a very good intervention by a, by a colleague from another party and I, I someone I've actually never met because I, I, was on, I was only present in the house for about, um, I don't know, seven or eight weeks before, uh, before we went into, uh, into lockdown. In fact, I haven't been back in parliament since, since December. And I, I wrote this member of parliament a note saying, hey, listen, you know, we don't know each other. We've never met, uh, but I think this was a really good intervention you did. It was very constructive, very thoughtful. Um, so from, from that point of view, it, is, it has been a very interesting uh, parliamentary session, uh, even more so as a minister. Um, I, I, I guess learning. Um, I, I don't get the, 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 the benefit in terms of uh, of learning from colleagues when I'd be sitting in the ha sitting in the house or or meeting them at uh, at cabinet because now uh, cabinet uh, obviously cabinet meetings are are all virtual. Um, so it's been an interesting uh, learning process. Um, and in terms of the challenges, really. Um, I mean, we've had um, just like uh, every order of government in, in in this country and around the world, we've had to turn around quickly and, and in my case, figure out how we could support the the arts, culture, and and amateur sports sector in in Canada, uh, which is how we came up with a, a number of initiatives, uh, emergency uh, funds for for arts, culture, and and sports organization, working with provinces, working with uh, national organizations, to, to to really, I mean, the, our goal over the last year is really to try and keep the ecosystem as intact as 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 possible and i think you know by and large we've succeeded i'm i'm not saying we were able to to help everybody but uh, i i in conversation with people from from the live performance uh, industry music industry museums um people are struggling but they're still there and and they're you know they're they're, they're tired there's a lot of fatigue but we've been able to 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 keep our our artistic and cultural ecosystem largely intact so that as we start talking about relaunch and coming out of the of the covid then we will be able, we'll have some good some good foundations to to build on to to do, to do that and and thank you for talking about that because as we all know you know during these challenging times of physical distancing and mental health issues and so on and and the isolation the cultural sector is really one of the areas that is so important right now and yet being hit hard by this pandemic because as we all know you know the arts and culture really give meaning to our lives and and play a big role when it comes to wellness and healing. And so I think that your file in particular is, is more important now than ever before, especially when it comes to contributing to building that resilience and, and that fabric of, of what it is and what it means to be Canadian. And, and so uh, tell me a little bit more about that and what you're, make, what you're doing to ensure that the, 
the the sector recovers well and that the future is strong when it comes to arts and culture you touched on a couple of things certainly some of the initiatives you've done in sport which is uh, being very well received i also know that there's a black history education curriculum piece that has been uh, moving forward in uh, through the university of dalhousie you know some very key pieces that i think uh, you've put a lot of thought into and uh, and and please tell me more about about what you're trying to do well, one thing we we asked ourselves is why 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 support the sector? I mean, and and why should we do it? And there are some interesting um, historical ex experiences um, coming out of the Great Depression. Uh, FDR um, quickly realized that uh, to to bring the the U.S. out of the Great the Great Depression, uh, of course, he needed uh, stimulus package measures for 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 the economy and for for jobs. But he needed he needed something to lift people's spirits and and that was that was arts and culture and, and so arts and culture was 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 one of the founding blocks of of the new deal in in the us because because president roosevelt realized that you know if we if we wanted to emerge of that that really dark and and, and heavy uh period we, we we need we needed to see the future um it, it with brighter lights and and, and so so a number of artists and artistic and cultural initiative were were funded in in the U.S. I mean, some of us will go to the many U.S. cities to see those beautiful murals that that we admire so much. Well, these these are a product of 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 the New Deal, and and, and I think really the, the the same we can draw from from that to to look at our at our situation and what we've been living through over over the last year. It, it, it was difficult, but imagine how difficult it would have been if we hadn't had all those those artists uh, doing going out of their way to find ways to reach us uh, obviously in the virtual world and um, not so much in the physical world but uh, online concert online shows online plays and and it's been pretty amazing um and, and i think we we owe our our, our artists a, a, a debt of gratitude and and so when talking with cabinet colleagues, with the Minister of Finance, with the Prime Minister, this is clearly something that I brought to the table and, and something that was really well received uh, to the extent that in, in, in Monday's budget, uh, uh, we, uh, the, the federal government has made a historical investment in, in, in the arts, uh, in the arts, culture and, and sports. So, orders of magnitudes what, what what we've seen before because we we're realizing that this is clearly as you were saying one of the most impacted sector but 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 at the same time as we're we're dealing with with the covid challenges we're we're also uh, we're, we're also trying to rise up to other challenges um you, you spoke about black lives matters and 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 how do we deal with with, with systemic racism that, that that that's that's present in our in our society and certainly in our institutions um, yeah. Which is why we we, we decided to to allocate uh, for forty million dollars for for the Indigenous Screen Office, which is which had which was created a few years ago, but didn't have funding to be able to to promote right. uh, First Nations, Métis, and, and 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 Inuit culture on 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 the big screen on on, on TV. Uh, Sixty million dollars to the to the to the to the Canada Media Fund uh, to 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 help support productions from equity seeking groups uh, mm -hmm. and, and these two these two things put together it's the equivalent almost the equivalent of the annual budget of Telefilm Canada so wow. really ensuring that we're we're giving these voices and we're ensuring that these voices can be seen can be heard in in ways that they that they haven't uh so far in our history in in Canada so we are trying to to tackle uh, many challenges at the same time and thank you for sharing that because um, you know this is uh, an important time and an important moment in time where a lot of Canadians are are facing some real uh, tough challenges uh, and you touched on and our country is becoming more diverse so you know indigenous peoples immigrants racialized people we all know this growth will continue as government leaders work to ensure we have a strong solid workforce in the future um, you've touched on this a bit but I'm I'm very interested in what you are doing really to address the issues of equity, diversity, and especially inclusion. After all, uh, key to immigrants being successful once they land here are supports and resources as they transition. And, and so 
you know, education is a key part of that, and and you've touched on some of the things that you're doing. But please uh, tell me more. Well, I I think trying to trying to tackle this issue is is about three things, at least from the, from the federal go government perspective. Um, uh, First, it's about uh, who do we nominate on our, our, our federal institutions, crown corporations. I mean, historically, if you look around the boardroom, it has tended to be largely white men over 50s. More recently, we started nominating women uh, a, a little bit, but in terms of diversity, it was still very thin. Uh, since we came into office in, in, in 2015, uh, that diversity in, in the boardroom for federal organizations ha has been increased by, 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 by 50 percent. I can give you a few examples uh, of some of the nominations I did. Uh, Jesse Wente, uh, very well known in, 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 in the Canadian production uh, sector, uh, first, first time an Indigenous person is, is named head of the Canadian Arts Council. Uh, Gaetan Varna, who's now also, uh, who's uh, from uh, from originally from Haiti, but very involved in, in, in Toronto in, in the arts and culture uh, scene, uh, also on the, on on the board of the uh, the arts and culture sector. Uh, the first Muslim women uh, to, to 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 lead uh, one one of uh, Canada's nas national museum, uh, Aisha Khan, in, in in Winnipeg at the National Human Rights Museum. So I I think we have. It. These nominations have to reflect uh, the, the Canadian population and, uh, and the Canadian diversity, and they didn't in the past. And I'm not saying they do now. I'm saying we've started on, on that path, but there's still a long way to go. I think it's also about, um, about the, uh, the, the, our legislative agenda. How, how are the, the, the bills that we're putting forward uh, as a government trying to, to tackle some, 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 of the, some of these issues? And uh, we've seen clearly um, my colleague, Minister Lametti, the Justice Minister, putting forward a, a number of, uh, of pieces of legislation to try and, to, to, to try and get at the root of, uh, of systemic racism, uh, getting rid of a mandatory sentencing, for example, which we know clearly target more uh, Canadians um, uh, of, of different et ethnic background. Uh, uh, indigenous Canadians are clearly, I mean, the data is, is, is so clear on that. So, so moving away from that and trying to, to work on, 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 on for, for minor offenses, getting people away from the judicial system and into a, a community and, and support system. So helping as opposed to penalizing. Um, I could talk about obviously uh, the, uh, the 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 UNDRIP legislation that has been that has been tabled. I have tabled my the first bill that I tabled as a as a minister, Bill Bill C five on the Truth and Reconciliation Day, so that we we remember this this very dark um, passage uh, of our past, but so that we don't repeat the same type of of mistakes uh, in, in 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 into the future. And I think that the third thing that we need to do is to put our our, our money where our mouth is. I mean, if we're serious about reconciliation, if we're serious about equity, then we have to we have to give the tools, the resources to to those people in Canada uh, that haven't in, in the past. Um, initiatives like the the, the Black Entrepreneur uh, Fund that, that that was created. I, I gave some examples in terms of uh, uh, on the production side, some, some of the elements that were uh, that were in the uh, in the budget. I could talk about. I'm. It's not very well known, but I am also the minister responsible for the implementation of the Indigenous Languages Act, which mm -hmm. was adopted in 2019, um, just before the election. When we when we came into power in 2015, the federal government invested five million dollars for Indigenous languages across the country. Uh, today, it's about 60. Uh, with uh, with the money that was announced in the budget, it's going to go up to over a hundred million dollars. So in a matter of, of six years, we went from five millions to more than a hundred million dollars for indigenous languages in, in this country. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not saying that's enough, I, I, but I'm saying it's substantially more uh, on this path to reconciliation with, uh, with, with indigenous peoples in, in, in this country. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. And, you know, I have to say, uh, you know, so important, as you mentioned, to have all Canadians being reflected in some of those senior leadership positions, you know, whether we're talking about organizations or corporations 
or government and certainly government bodies and and important to uh, hear about some of the initiatives that you're bringing about in, to ensure that that those pipelines are built essentially. Minister Gibo, I understand, you know, I'm going to switch a little bit. You talked about language and I'm just going to move, you know, slightly in a, in a different direction, but stay on the diversity piece and inclusion piece. You know, I understand that you're looking at uh, ways to control hate speech online right mm -hmm. now. You know, uh, we're all aware, unfortunately, of the rise of these sorts of things, you know, as COVID has hit us and folks are isolated and people are online more. Uh, unfortunately, racist bullying appears to be more of an issue uh, now than it has been in the past, and it, it appears at times to be growing. Uh, I understand that you're examining ways at controlling hate speech. Uh, what are you planning and what are your thoughts on this? Uh, you're absolutely right, and there's there's so much data in the liter in the literature that 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 shows how much uh, how much hate speech uh, we are seeing online, how much incitement to to violence, to terrorism, um, and this idea that we can leave it to the platforms to self regulate simply doesn't work. And you know the, the clearest example, if we needed more examples of that, uh, is what what happened uh, on Capitol Hill uh, last on January 6, where we know that extremist groups in the United States, but we would be fools to think that it's only happening in the United States. Uh, but these groups in the United States use social media platforms to recruit, to fundraise, to arm themselves and to organize what was by by all accounts an attempted military coup in in, in a democracy and and left left on check i i think that these problems are of a very threat to the foundations of of our democracies and it's just not to canada because i'm having conversations with, with with my counterparts in 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 the uk in in france in in in, in the ukraine in many developing countries this is this is a global this is a global problem uh, and more and more governments around the planet are, are wanting to do something about it. So I, I will be bring, I will be tabling legislation in the coming weeks mm -hmm. uh, to look at how we could tackle a series of online harms. And hate speech would certainly be one of them: the incitement to violence, uh, incitement to terrorism, the, the non-consensual sharing of intimate images, uh, and also a, a, a child sexual exploitation. Um, we're, we've been working obviously closely with the Justice Department on that. We've been working with a number of, of non-governmental organizations in, in Canada uh, who have expertise in, the, in, in these different fields. We've been working with experts and we've obviously been working with, with a number of countries. There aren't a lot of countries that have tried to tackle this uh, around the world. There's really a handful of them, but we've been, we've been in close contact with them. Um, France, Germany, Australia, uh, Definitely, the United Kingdom put out a white paper in December uh, for for for, the, for their path toward toward towards uh, legislating uh, many of these things. So there is a a growing movement of of countries around the world who are saying we we have to do something about this, and um, and and Canada is certainly one of them. Well, thank you so much, Minister Gibo. Uh, that's it for me for now. We are a very thoughtful and insightful uh, discussion. I'm now going to turn it over to Andrew Cardozo, who I think is going to be uh, asking you a few more questions about broadcasting, digital giants, and so on. But thank you uh, for answering those questions right now. Thank you very much, Indira. Thank you, Indira. Thank you, Minister, for joining us. Um, before I get to my questions, I just want to share with you in the audience a couple of uh, interesting facts, and since you're the Heritage Minister, I want to share a couple of Heritage moments with you. Uh, today uh, at the Pearson Centre, we're happy to note that it's the 124th birthday of Lester B. Pearson. And inter interestingly, yesterday would be the 50th anniversary of when he became uh, Prime Minister. And I think it's worth noting from kind of Heritage point of view or from, you know, who we are as Canadians, his government did a lot in terms of the kinds of basic Canadian values uh, that we put in place, of course, the uh, the Canadian flag, and I and I will take a moment to thank you for for the words you sent us for our website on on the anniversary of, of Flag Day earlier this year. Um, but certainly, Pearson brought in Medicare and CPP, and it's worth reflecting on that as this week your government is introducing childcare. Mm -hmm. So it's another one of those major major pieces of government policy that we want to 
uh, we want to define ourselves. And one other other fun fact is that uh, Pearson in 1968, February of 1968, amended the um, the Broadcast Act or brought into what what was called the Broadcast Act and created the CRTC in uh, in 1968. And bizarrely, before then, there was something called the the Board of Broadcast Governors, which was both the regulator and the board that governed the CBC. Um, at some point, somebody decided those things didn't didn't belong together. Our governance standards have changed over the decades. <laughs> yes, so that's for sure. Uh, so let me let, let's. I, I'd like to talk a little bit, bit about uh, Bill C10. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of this conference, we had a webinar last week on on Bill C10, which a number of, with a number of the players who have various interests in it. Um, but I'll ask you to tell us a little bit about your objectives in, B, in Bill C10, which is noteworthy because it is 30 years since the bill was was last amended. Another heritage fun fact, it was back in the days of Brian Mulroney when, when it was last amended. So mm -hmm. a lot of time has passed and you've taken on this gargantuan uh, task of, of, of amending the act, which I, I think a lot of governments wanted to do, but always kind of got, got you know, got the cold feet when it came to time. So you've, you've taken it on. And what what's your objective here? Well, the Broadcasting Act um, plays a very important role from a, from a cultural sovereignty perspective in in Canada, and basically it was it was put in place as a way of of protecting our our heritage uh, from from the American cultural invasion, and and we we just so happen to live. Uh, just north of uh, of an international cultural powerhouse that is the United States of America, uh, and, and what we did uh, the last time that that that, that it was amended uh, under Brian uh, under Brian Mulroney was to put in place a a system that would basically protect Canadian broadcasters from from being swallowed by by American giants. Um, and it also ensured that we we had a system in place where those who, who benefits uh, who benefit from 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 from, from the from Canadian culture w would invest in it, uh, and and it was done through a licensing licensing system. So Canadian broadcasters, in order to be able to use public airwaves, need a license. That license is is obtained through through the CRTC, and an ex and that license is basically a a shield uh, against Amer American cultural invasion. That's that's ultimately what it does. Um, and in exchange for that for that license, um, bro broadcasters uh, have to invest part of their revenues in in the production of of Canadian cultural content, uh, either on the music side of, uh, or or audio visual. Now. As you pointed out earlier, we we, we haven't revised uh, that bill since the the early 90s, uh, and you know uh, in the early 90s the internet wasn't a very big thing uh, around here or anywhere else around the world. Uh, it that has changed, and and our, our our cultural habits in terms of where do we watch what we watch has certainly changed a lot, and we've seen the the massive arrival of of those of those giants that are Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney Plus and Spotify, Apple Music, Google Music. And these companies have no obligations uh, in our regulatory system because our regulatory system wasn't adapted to, 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 to these players. And ultimately what Bill C-10 in, tries to do or, or, or will do, um, it, it will enable us to, to, to ensure that our laws and regulations for broadcasting apply to Canadian broadcasters, of course, but also apply to, to, to web giants who are active in the in the sector. So it's not a legislation that wants to go after every single web giants, but if if those companies are in the in the broadcasting system or in, in the broad, broadcasting business, then our, our laws and regulations could apply. And so we want Netflix. Um, has lots of clients in 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 Canada and and benefits greatly from 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 this. Well, we we think it's only fair that, to ask Netflix to invest some of those revenues, just like 
uh, Rogers is doing, just like Bell is doing, just like Quebecor in, in Quebec, or, or even obviously the CBC uh, are, are, are all doing. So it's really about ensuring that our system is fair. And right now it's not fair. We have, we have Canadian organizations that have regulatory obligations, including spending obligations. And we have international web giants that have none of these obligations and yet are benefiting greatly from our, for, from our system. So it, that's really quite interesting, the way you put, especially the start of your answer, with the, the reason we had that broadcast was to, the act was to defend and, and build Canadian broadcasters. And of course, then you were talking about broadcasters like uh, CBS, uh, ABC, NBC, and now it's another group of, uh, and they're still there, but, but mm -hmm. another group of, of major giants. Um, how do you do that balance? And I, and I look at this sort of the debates that have been happening in places like Australia, where some of these giants are saying, if you dare touch us, we're out of here. Um, and then you've got a lot of people in Canada, and I don't know who the majority is, but you've got certainly an articulate voice in Canada saying, hands off the internet, don't don't go there, just let let it do what it does. Um, I mean, basically when it comes to web giants, we're really trying to do three things in Canada. We're trying to ensure that those that are active in the cultural sector are paying their fair share. And that's really what Bill C-10 is about. And I've, I've, I've spoken to most of the companies that are in that sector and, you know, as much as companies can like it when government come up with new regulations, they, they don't mind this one too much. Then there's there's online hate, which we, we, we talked a little bit about earlier. earlier. And, and frankly, by and large, um, social media companies welcome uh, government put in, putting in place regulations because they need our help to deal with this, with, with this problem. And many of these platforms have said so publicly. And, and the third category is, is media remuneration. I mean, as we know, uh, Facebook, and, 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 and this is really a, an, an issue that, so, so these companies are, you know, obviously none of our, our legislation are, are tackling all of these companies. Different companies are involved in different elements. And, and, and the news aspect is really about Facebook and Google and how they benefit greatly from from the media content that is produced by by our Canadian media, yet they don't contribute. So I, again, this issue of fairness and and that is where in Australia uh, there was a a big fight uh, between the Australian government and. Yes. And, and Facebook, um, and and I will be I, I will be tabling legislation on that. Uh, we're not we're not quite there yet for for the for the news remuneration. Um, and you're right. I mean, they are those people who say you know the, the, this issue of uh, net neutrality and they, that they should be no laws on on the internet. I think this goes back to this initial idea when 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 the web was conceived that it was going to be this. This wonderful place uh, where we could have dialogue between people around the world and exchange ideas, and it was going to be this, 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 um, this. The, there would be no boundaries and no borders, and it would be amazing. Well, I mean, there's certainly some of that, uh, but as we've spoken earlier, you know, there's there's a lot of hate speech online. Um, Facebook and Google um, have turn most of the internet into a giant shopping mall uh, where um, what, what's being sold is us, is our, is our data. As I mean, mo most of you have probably heard, you know, data is the new oil. Our personal data will be to the economy of the 21st century, what oil was to the economy of the 19th and 20th century. And, and so this, this romantic idea of, of, of this net being this wonderful place that, that would need no laws or regulations is, is something of the past. And, and really, there's a handful of, of people who, who strongly believe in that, but most Canadians don't. And the vast majority of, uh, of governments around the planet are coming to, to the realization that we need, to, we need to do something. We need to do something. So Bill C-10 is a good example. I've had conversation with ministers in, in Germany uh, asking me about Bill C-10 or, or Ukraine, uh, Finland, Denmark, because they, I mean, they have similar cultural issues uh, as we do. The, 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 the U.S. cultural roller coaster is as invasive in Denmark as it is in, in, in Canada, perhaps a bit more in Canada. But so I'm, I'm, I'm having conversations with, with governments around, around the planet who are saying we have very similar issues, so let's work together. And that's exactly what, what we're doing. And, and we've actually launched a, 
coalition of countries uh, working together on all of these issues, on, on the cultural issue, on the online hate issue, and on the news remuneration uh, issue. And uh, that coalition is composed of France, uh, Germany, Australia, Finland, and I suspect other countries will, will join soon enough because obviously these are global problems that, that demand global solutions. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. So do you see that as you go through this, um, you'll be watching each other. So everybody's watching Australia right now to see how their legislation goes. And then you look at it and, and, and copy it or, or, or learn from it. Absolutely. Uh, we've, uh, we, I've had a number of conversation with my, my Australian counterpart. Um, I've spoken to the Australian regulator uh, himself, the person in charge of uh, of putting in place the system for on, on news remuneration. I've also spoken to the Australian e-safety commissioner. So they've had legislation in place uh, around online harms for, for, for some times, and they have what they call the e-safety commissioner office in Australia that deals with, with the, with, with these issues. And there's a, uh, there's actually a, a great willingness on a part of countries that have stepped up. And, and as I said, on, on, on the issue of online harms, there's only a handful of countries that have done that. Uh, but they're quite happy to work with us and to, to share their experience, you know, what has worked, what, has, what hasn't worked so well. So I, I wouldn't say we will copy necessarily the Australian approach uh, when it comes to new, news remuneration, but we, but we are looking at what they've done and, and how could we do it in Canada? Our, our institutions are different, our bodies are, 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 of laws and regulations are, are different, our, our news media ecosystem, ecosystem is different. So we'll need to find a solution that, that's adapted to, 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 to the Canadian context. Okay, um, as we have this conversation, I wanna just uh, pull in a couple of questions that are coming in um, online from our, from our audience. And here's one which is fairly specific. Um, regarding uh, C10, will the government ensure that the internet giants like Netflix will be subject to the status of the Artist Act so that unions can compel these companies to collectively bargain. This is a, this is indeed a very specific question. Um, we're so the as we speak, uh, the, the the Heritage Committee is is adopting um, clause by clause uh, the, the 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 amended bill, uh, which will then be brought back to the to, to, to the House of Commons. Um, um, many of uh, many of the people on my team are actively engaged in those conversations. The parliamentary secretary, uh, my parliamentary secretary Julie De Bruyssen, is is also there. So I can't I can't comment exactly, but we will we will know in the coming uh, in the coming days mostly uh, what what the what the, the 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 amended bill will will look like and what will or won't be in it. So, so uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that, about the next steps of the bill? It's, uh, as you say, it's in clause by clause, so everybody's put their men, just for people in the public who may not be precisely aware of how, how it goes. The bill has passed second reading in the House, goes to committee. The committee hears from a bunch of people who have amendments to suggest, and they're going through amendments now as to which ones they're going to pass. And once they're finished with it, it comes back to the House. Um, I think that's, correct me if I'm wrong, that's sort yeah. of roughly process exactly um what's your sense of the time frame of when this will pass the house and and the and what what's your sense of, of amendments like where are you, which amendments are you willing to accept or what's your feeling about these amendments coming forward um from the get-go, I, I I said very clearly that we would be happy to entertain amendments to to, to the bill. Um, I personally don't think that there's 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 no such thing as a perfect bill. Uh, it can always be improved upon. Um, then again, you can't never you can never have a, a perfect bill, even after everybody and their sisters have come up with the amendments uh, that they want to, to, to see. So at one point, you have to decide: is that good enough? Will that help the Canadian cultural sector? And if the answer to that is yes, then let's move forward. Um, so, so we will be looking at the amendments. I'm. Um, all sorts of amendments. Some people wanted more recognition of uh, French, like a stronger wording around around French indigenous production, which in fact we had already brought forward in the, in the initial version of, of the bill. Um, uh, some of the amendments around around uh, ownership of, of broadcasters. So there is a, there's a bit of a confusion. Some people 
thought that the that the the bill the act as it is right now protected Canadian companies from from being purchased from from foreign companies. In fact, it's not in it's not in the act right now. What's protecting Canadian ownership was an order in council adopted by 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 the government in 1994. Uh, which is still, which is still uh, what protects our, our, our Canadian companies. Some people would like to would like that to be included in, into uh, into the bill. Um, so I, I'm very happy to, to to contemplate and to to accommodate many uh, many amendments. Uh, it's going to come back to the House. We'll see what 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 the new bill looks like. Um, it needs to be adopted, then sent to the sent to the Senate. The senators. Um, will obviously look at it they might have they, they they might have amendments of their own i'm really hoping and i'm i'm working really hard to ensure that this bill can be adopted before we finish our work in june um and i think it's feasible it's ambitious but but feasible i i wouldn't want us to to to, to leave parliament in june and not have that this this bill adopted so and that would be what when you say adopted by by both houses of, of parliament yes yes yeah, um, and and in terms of amendments, you're um, you're not being terribly possessive about it. It's not going to be. This is your baby. Nobody's going to touch it. Nobody's going to change no. it. No, <laughs> I, I I won't. I I think we came up with a. And in fact, when we presented the bill initially, many organizations across the country saluted it. Some even called it an a, an historical moment for. For, for for music and audiovisual production in in this country, but I I you know I I don't have uh, all the good ideas, and my team and I don't have all the good ideas. Other people do, so we're we're very happy to 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 look at them and take a, a really strong and serious look at at these ideas yeah. and how they could improve upon what we we for, we initially tabled. Yeah, just I, I just make got to make a quick comment as a think tank looking at how these things work from the outside. I just think that's the best way to go because uh, it's when a government is intransigent, especially a minority government, that you don't get things done. Um, so having that 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 approach to to others having input would really make it happen on time if you want it to happen within a certain uh, stretch of time and and make it and make it a good bill when other people have um, input. Um, we've got Agreed. a few more questions, and some of them do touch on on some of the subjects we've talked before. So so we'll go back and forth if if that's okay with you. Of course. Uh, so first, I'll, I'll, I'll read this out and probably needs a little amendment based on what we talk about. But uh, culture is the arena that can best uh, address extremist ideology. Yet there are no order and council appointments of racialized or indigenous Canadians as CEO of a cultural agency. Are you committed to changing this proactively? So I, I, I guess I would amend that. So you mentioned that the uh, Canadian Museum of, uh, With- of Human Rights has has a as a, a CEO who is a, a racialized uh, person, uh, but just in terms of and and the chair and the chair of the Canada Arts Arts Council, uh, Jesse right, Wente, yeah. uh, I believe, I, I I think Jesse is Anishinaabe. I I could be wrong. Um, certainly, a very uh, prominent Indigenous pro- producer yeah, in right, in Canada, First Nation. Yeah. First Nation yeah. But I I'm not sure if he's Anishinaabe. But so we started doing that. Absolutely. Could we do more of it? Yes. Okay, um, the, ne- the next question is in regards on a similar theme um, with regards to ethnic and third language broadcasting. So I've got a couple of questions that have come in and I'll try and combine them to or the t- two of them. So what is your view on ethnic and third language broadcasting in Canada today? And how can we ensure that the independent ethnic broadcasters have an opportunity to serve these audiences in their in this new broadcasting world? That's a very good question. Um, to be honest, I don't think we've been doing a, a very good job in Canada so far, and and we are trying to to to, to change this. Both uh, yeah, Telefilm Canada, the Canada uh, the, the, the Canada Media Fund, uh, in terms of uh, of how what we fund directly at, at Canadian Heritage, um, the C10 does have an uh, does have does have elements of that as well in terms of the, the changes. Let me give you a clear example. Um, the act, the Broadcasting Act, as it is right now, basically says that broadcasters can 
invest in indigenous production, but it's not right. an obligation. We're changing that. It's going to be an obligation to invest a certain percentage of their revenues in indigenous production. Um, I mean, and we're giving the CRTC some leeway in terms of the implementation of how uh, of how this uh, this is going to be done. Uh, we could think of incentive mechanisms where if you're if you're a broadcaster, if you're uh, either a traditional broadcaster or a platform, Netflix or Amazon Prime, um, you have uh, spending obligations. Well, we could imagine a system where if if that platforms in, invest in a in a BIPOC production, then uh, this for each dollar that they invest, it counts for a dollar fifty in terms of achieving their their spending obligations. So there there's different you know there's 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 regulatory mechanisms that, that that we can certainly put in place, but there's also incentive mechanisms that we can put in place to ensure that we have more diversity on our on our screens. Um, yeah, I I, I want to uh, just in terms of the the um, the third language broadcasting, I I, I want to share an idea that is very early and but but urgent, and that's with regards to um, getting information to people who who are not fluent in English and French about COVID. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's been, it strikes me that we that in English and French, we have an enormous amount of information that we get on TV and radio all day, especially if you listen to, uh, you know, whether it's CBC or TV or others. Um, but if you, and so, you know, there's always updated information, a lot of experts coming and talking about it. But if you don't speak English or French, you don't have access to that information. And I'm thinking about the hotspots in in the Greater Toronto area in Montreal, where there's a lot of newer immigrants who are working in warehouses and factories and supermarkets, where the the rate of of COVID is the highest. Um, there's a clear lack of information to some extent, being one one of the issues. I wonder if there's a way one can work with the the third language broadcasters, Health Canada. Um, and then the, the plethora of doctors, because if you, if you look at television in English and French, a lot of the experts who are speaking are themselves people of various origins, either born in Canada or elsewhere, but a number of them will have fluency in other languages. I wonder if there's a way to pull all that together and get some of that information to, um, to those people in those hotspots. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sort of you you might not have an answer to this because I'm I, well. I actually, I think it's a it's a great idea, which is why we at Heritage Canada have been working with Health Canada to ensure that 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 the COVID information is available in numerous different languages. And I think right now, I I don't have the last count, but I think it, it it's being it's being diffused in um in in ethnic media across the country. I think it's 15 or 16 different. Uh, languages uh, okay. across the country, uh, exactly for 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 the for the reasons you you're outlining. I mean, we we need to we need to be able to communicate uh, to, to people in in their own languages, especially if they're not fluent in either English or French. Um, so this is this is happening. I, we might I, I think we could do more than 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 what we're doing on on that front certainly, and and that's uh, that's an ongoing conversation we're we're having uh, at the government. If okay, I could just jump in, Andrew, just, just to add to that, you know, in a specific uh, sector of the community that needs this kind of assistance are seniors. So certainly newcomer seniors, folks who are here as grandparents who are, uh, are you know, a, a lot of times cut off from the rest of the family and the rest of the community. And so those, uh, those pathways and supports are really important. And as we all know, as people age also, they oftentimes will revert to their language of comfort. So even though they may have had a, a fair amount of proficiency in English earlier on in their lives, uh, as they age and and uh, things progress, they they go back to uh, you know speaking in in the language that they mm -hmm. uh, learned and acquired as as a young person. So it uh, it's so important that this information be available, uh, especially now. Agreed. Um, Great, thank you. And I just mentioned, Indira, in her career in broadcasting, was that for a while at Omni, uh, the multilingual broadcaster mm -hmm. out of Toronto. Um, I the the next question I want to ask you, Minister, is about the CBC. What is your what is your view of the CBC vis-a-vis uh, -vis private broadcasters and the global web giants? Well, I'm a strong believer in the in, in the public broadcaster. Um, I, I I think it's a it's a 
very important important institution um, for, 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 for Canadians. Uh, it has played a, a very, and continues to play a very important role in, in our society in, in both English and French. And it's starting to, 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 to branch out as well in, in, other, in other languages. Um, our government has has made has made historic investment in 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 the CBC after years of of, of cutbacks just a, just a few uh, a few years ago. Um, just in the last budget, CBC got a, a bit more money. Uh, working uh, working with them, I mean, obviously, it's an, an, an independent organization. It has its own board um i often get messages from people who want me to intervene because you know that show has been taken down or that other show has been taken down the canadian heritage minister doesn't have anything to do um and i think it's a very good thing i i think the last thing we want to do is to have a politicized system where the government decides what's good what's not good what should be on the air what what shouldn't we should leave that to experts and and i'm certainly not i'm certainly not an expert but but in terms of you know whether in terms of vision uh in terms of how how we can support the mission of the CBC and ensure that 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 mission reflects the, the great diversity of Canada. There we can have a conversation with them and we are certainly having a, a great conversation with them. So so if I would if I were to ask you, can you get Kim's convenience back on the answer is you can't. <laughs> Liz, I love the show. I really and I was so saddened and I read a number of articles as to why the show wasn't coming back. And I understand, you know, the person doing it was just ran was ran ran out dry of 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 ideas it was just too much but it, it was a great show but unfortunately or fortunately i should say fortunately the, the canadian heritage minister can't intervene and i think again i think that's a good thing yeah yeah um and in fact may if for, for many reasons that is why there is a crtc is so that that you as the minister is not making those decisions whether it's that or who should get a license and we don't want our politicians making those those decisions we not have politicians but i mean we've all kind of decided that's not your role that's somebody else's role we have examples around the world where government are doing this and it it rarely turns out very well yeah yeah um let, let me ask you another question the, the minister mentioned c10 and the crtc can he clarify the impact legend the Im the impact the legislation may have specifically at the CRTC and regulation of broadcasting on access, reflection and employment in media for diverse Canadians, including racialized and indigenous people and people living with disabilities. Uh, there are a number of elements in, in the bill uh, regarding uh, r racialized Canadians, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, community, um, uh, disabled. So we are trying to create a, as I said earlier, a more diverse representation on, on screen of uh, of what's out there in 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 Canada. Um, so what what Bill C10 will do is it will give new tools to to the CRTC in order to to do what it what it's supposed to do. Um, it's a it's a regulatory body. That, that 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 deals with with, with these issues essentially now with, with with conventional Canadian broadcasters soon enough after the, the after the bill gets uh, gets royal assent um, it will also include uh, online platforms uh, to 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 do this I mean I I didn't really talk about it but but obviously as people are moving away from from traditional broadcasters to online broadcasters what what this means is that there's less and less money available for our cultural production in Canada because uh, because those platforms don't have any spending obligations um and if we don't do anything in the next 2 years they would be more than 1 billion dollars less for Canadian production if we adopt C10 and 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 put it in place in in about two years, uh, we would have not only would we we would would we not see that decline of one billion dollar, but we would see we would see an increase of around eight hundred million dollars for Canadian production. Uh, so, just in terms of of being able to continue telling our stories and not everybody, you know, I love watching uh, Scandinavian TV. I think it's great. There's lots of, of great thing, but I. I want to continue being able to to 
to, to, to see our own stories, our Canadian stories, our, our very diverse stories. We're talking, I mean, Kim, Kim, Kim Convenience is certainly a, a great example of, of that. So we need to give ourselves the means to be able to continue doing that. Yeah. Um, let me ask you the next question. The minister speaks about C10 applying to internet giants, um, yet it applies to any website that has sound or video content. Why not restrict the bill to internet broadcasting giants, i.e. those having X customers and Y in income? That is exactly what the bill is doing. So I'm not particularly interested from a broadcasting point of view in um, the hunting videos that my stepfather posts uh, every year uh, after hunting season. That's not what we're going after here. What we're going after are the large players in, in, in the broadcasting sector. And, and we will ask the, 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 the CRTC, you know, the, the, the CRTC will have to make a determination who's in, who's out. There'll, there'll be a threshold that, that's going to be put uh, somewhere. But we're, we're really talking about those players that have a material impact on, on, on what's happening in, 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 in Canada. I, I've named them. Um, I mean, there, there are probably a couple of others, but we're not going after everything that obviously not going after everything that's being published on, on, on the internet. That's not what we're trying to do here. Okay, um, here's another fairly specific question. Um, so the, the writer says, not to take away from the need to address inequities in BIPOC and intersectional communities, ageism, as it refers to our vibrant elder artists and gender bias, um, for example, de-hiring of women over 50 in certain broadcasting positions, remains issues that we need to to address. How do all these issues of diversity dovetail with Canadian broadcasting? Um, I mean, that's that's a very good question. Um, there's there's certainly as a government we can certainly lead by example. Um, and I said earlier in 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 the bill we 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 are. There, there's a number of elements that, that speak about uh, about diversity and 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 will guide the CRTC to ensure that through the licensing system, through the spending requirement system, uh, we we have a more and more diverse um, representation of what Canada is on on our on our screen. So I think it's a combination of leading by example and ensuring we have the right regulatory tools to to to, to see that happen in Canada. Okay, um, we're about out of time. I just have one quick question, but it might be a big one. Um, and that all, all this ties together. You've talked a lot about, about the CRTC. Um, there are some who've been believing for a long time that it's time to get rid of the CRTC. We don't need regulation. What's your argument of why you want a CRTC and what, what its role should be going forward in this new world? Well, if if we want to, you know, if... It, if we want to abandon our cultural sovereignty um, and and uh, have uh, you know American stories uh, by be told by by American artists, by Amer American writers, by American companies, and just you know ensure that 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 that, 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 that the Canadian fabric fades um, uh, into oblivion, then yes, we 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 should have no regulation. Um, that's that's not my belief. Uh, that's not our government's belief, and frankly, that's not a the the, the belief of a very uh, big majority of uh, of Canadians. Okay. Well, thank you. I I, I just uh, before turning over to Indira for the final word, I just want to say thank you. Um, I I've, I've got to I say people have got to be impressed with your with your learning this huge and complex portfolio over a relative period of time and. Uh, but I think you've had a you've had a reputation of being a passionate person about issues you care about, and that comes across very well. So congratulations to the work you're doing. Thank you Thank for joining you. us. Uh, this is the end of our conference for three weeks, and I'll just say to our audience, we're going to take a week or two off, but we'll be back with more webinars soon. All the webinars we've had to date will be available on our uh, uh, on our YouTube channel, including the one for today. So please tell your your friends and relatives about this wonderful discussion we've had today. Uh, with that, thank you, Minister, and over to you, Indira. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Minister Gibo. Uh, you know, really insightful and thoughtful uh, comments on so many things, but but learned so much uh, when I, you know, we explore Canadian culture, broadcasting, diversity, and web giants. A fascinating topic, and uh, a lot of your 
your comments really help to understand in a broader way the scope of, of your work and the importance of, of a lot of the things that you and your folks at your ministry are doing. So I just want to thank you and thank everyone in our audience for joining us in this important conversation today for your commitment to helping build a strong foundation for Canada moving forward. Uh, again, this was part of the Pearson Change Conference discussion. So many wonderful series as part of the webinars. And as Andrew mentioned, please uh, go to our website and try to catch some of those conversations. Uh, you'll find out what Canadians are thinking as we are uh, entering and, and being a part of this very interesting time uh, as we deal with the pandemic from our homes and online and to think about how we can build a stronger Canada for all of us as we look to the future. Uh, hope you've enjoyed today. Very nice seeing you all and thank you, Minister Gibault. Thanks. Thank you very much, Indira. Take care.